let's see if we get anyone to start trickling in here. Um, just taking a look to see how many folks are here. Welcome aboard. Let's see. Okay. Just bring up TikTok. Gravity does not affect any. Get our live stream on TikTok as well. Um, for some reason, not able to see who's in here, but I do know that there are folks in here, so please bear with me. Um, we will get started in just a moment. Hello, hello. Uh, welcome, folks. So today um, we're going to be discussing um, deliberative democracy um, and what it means to have a seat at the table. Um, it looks like folks are still trickling in. So if you have any specific questions based on the um, video we shared last week, please, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, I will be taking questions. I'm still waiting to see um, our numbers go up. I think I started a minute late or so. So hopefully folks keep uh, trickling in. Hello, Ryan. Hello, uh, retired Fed. Uh, today we are talking about um, deliberative democracy and what it would mean to give people a seat at the table in making laws. Um, so deliberative democracy is really something that um, has come about in the last uh, few decades as a new model to infuse our current democratic models with. Um, the way it works is similar to the way juries work in, in our justice system, but instead of for um, sentencing and for um, determining whether someone is innocent or guilty, this is actually about coming together to solve problems, to write laws. Um, and it gives people a seat at the table in this lawmaking process. And ultimately, um, this allows people to decide what issues want uh, they want to be solved, what issues are priorities, um, how to solve them. They actually get to learn about the different ways to solve these issues. Um, they learn about the downstream effects of some of those solutions. So some of the unintended consequences, um, how to play that game of whack-a-mole um, with those unintended consequences. They get to know their community better. And that means people that may not be like them. It's sort of a exposure of ideas um, to people who might not be as like-minded. So all of these things are actually benefits, um, ultimately, to democracy as a whole, right? Having civically engaged people, having people who are informed about how laws are made, informed about the difficulties, the challenges of resolving issues, um, being exposed to one another, different viewpoints, all of these things are really healthy for a democracy. Um, and so that, those are some of the benefits of deliberative democracy. The really nice thing um, I think that most people get excited about, though, is, um, apologies, I realize we're not streaming quite yet on Instagram. There we go. Um, the, the real benefit here, though, is in giving people a way to get involved um, in that lawmaking process. So Ultimately, what happens is, um, as of right now, I mean, we do have um, in some states a system by which citizens can uh, can propose laws. Right. We have um, initiatives, for example, in many states or referendums where citizens can actually propose laws, get them on the ballot and can vote on these uh, on these laws um, as propositions on their ballot when they go to the polls. Um, this takes it a bit of a step further and for, for a few good reasons. Some of those I already mentioned as far as getting to know your community better, uh, it's being exposed to other viewpoints, being more involved in the solutioning process. Um, but I think the, especially in contrast to the initiative and referendum process, which tends to be dominated surprisingly, or probably not so surprisingly, but I don't think people are as aware of this as in other lawmaking, but it, these, these discussions about initiatives and drafting of these initiatives are ultimately 
driven and dominated by lobbyists, right? So even if there is a ballot that was driven by a desire for the people to have some solution or to have some sort of a law passed, ultimately it sort of gets hijacked by special interest lobbyists who s- sort of beef it up with um, with language that may go unnoticed to everyday citizens, may go unnoticed even in the media, but ultimately favors the interests of that lobbyist group. And so by handing over the reins to our most um, direct form of democracy to lobbyists, we ultimately lose a lot of the control and really our voice in the process. And so what deliberative democracy does is it allows us to form what we call citizen conventions. And so that means that a, um, a community or, or folks in a community can form a petition just like they do for an, a usual initiative or referendum. And they can take that petition, get enough signatures to call for a citizens convention. And what a citizen convention is, is it then triggers um, the random selection of similarly to what I called a legislative jury. Uh, right. So you get a random selection of citizens from the community. So that means that it's not going to just be um, overflowing with lobbyists or people who have a specific perspective on the issue, a strong perspective on the issue. These are people who maybe have never even thought about the issue. Um, maybe they've thought about the issue from a, wow, this bothers me standpoint, but I've never thought about the solutions or the possible solutions to the issues and some of the challenges in implementing those solutions. So those people come together, a, roughly a group of 12 to 24 people. They are given a stipend. They are given employment protections so that by participating in the uh, the legislative jury or the citizen convention, I should start calling it, um, they do not have any risk of losing their jobs, the same as a regular jury. Um, And they come together in a um, in a forum that is mediated by a nonpartisan conflict resolution agency, an agency specialized in bringing people together to generate uh, constructive and creative solutions. Um, and they they can bring in experts, they can bring in panelists, they can dig into research, they can ask questions. And over the period of days or however long is defined in the, uh, the mandate given to the citizen convention, they discuss these issues and start to work out together the best way to solve them. Um, they also elect a speaker for the convention, who acts as sort of the facilitator, the leader of the convention, and that is done by ranked choice voting, which um, provides all sorts of benefits that we will discuss another week um, in a broader context. Um, and that that speaker helps sort of shepherd these people together to actually draft language with an expert um, who, who may be a legal expert or otherwise um, and can help facilitate that. And then upon the conclusion of the convention, actually, those folks... Um, those um, those speakers can bring that legislation to the legislature. In fact, the legislature is required to receive that person. Um, and when they receive them, um, they are required to consider that legislation and they are required to consider it as a um, independent of any other legislation. So there can't be horse trading. There can't be, yeah, we'll adopt this, but only if you, you know, uh, give us the ability to drill offshore or only if you um, do X, Y, and Z. They are required to be considered separately. Um, this helps facilitate making sure that uh, all of that hard work of the citizen conventions doesn't get thrown out due to muddy politics. Um, the other route is by actually putting that proposal back to the people. So similarly, again, to the initiative process, providing the people with a vote, the difference is that what people are voting on has not been crafted by lobbyists. It's been crafted by um, the people. And so this is a really interesting um, mechanism that I think a lot of countries are starting to adopt and experiment with, but it holds a lot of promise. And so we are um, putting that out there to solicit feedback on and to uh, to get feedback on what the people think as far as whether this is a good solution. Uh, we think it's a great upgrade to democracy. It is um, sort of infuses our very representative form of democracy or republic form of democracy with more direct aspects while maintaining some of the checks and balances, right? Because this isn't just people going in and passing laws left and right. This still needs to be voted on by the legislature, heard by the legislature, um, or passed through a hurdle of, of the people to vote on. So there are uh, checks and balances here. And also um, the, the convention is required to provide sort of like a readout on 
why they made the decisions they made, get, provide transparency and visibility into the process. So that's my um, explanation of uh, our, my first explanation of citizen conventions, deliberative democracy, and our proposal, a seat at the table. Um, I will probably have to explain it again as more people trickle in. But in the meantime, we do have some questions. Um, it looks like uh, Leonard has a question. Thank you again for being with us, Leonard. Um, it looks like you have a question about the assembly of shared interests, which, I, which I'm sorry, I would love to hold for next week. We have a really great explainer video on that, and I would love for everyone to be looped in before I actually get discussing um, that, because it is kind of a complicated and very unique and innovative proposal. Um, so if you could hold that for next week, I'd really appreciate it. Um, I do see you're talking a little bit about um, term limits there. Uh, I think it's a great question and whether it would apply there, I think we've left ambiguous and is a great point for discussion. We're open to, uh, if you want to send over some language for that, that isn't already in the document, uh, we're happy to take a look and potentially even include it in our second edition uh, when that is available. Um, your question on citizen conventions, though, would they then have to go through a full legislative process in the appropriate legislative district? The answer there is yes, but uh, I think as I mentioned a few minutes ago, it would be liberated of the potential to amend or to be horse traded with or lumped into or log rolled into other legislation. So that frees it from sort of that political or politicization of, um, of the usual legislative process and really allows um, the legislature, legislature to vote on that legislation in a um, in a in a more focused way, really considering the the proposal on its merits rather than in some sort of a strategic political way. Um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, if you have any follow ups, please feel free to let me know. Um, Bart, uh, yes. Uh, so Bart says not against term limits, but if the money issue isn't addressed, term limits won't ap accomplish much. I agree. Um, I often, and I've been saying in a lot of comments to folks in, across the various social media streams, whether it's TikTok or Facebook or our Substack, um, but none of these proposals should be really viewed in a vacuum. Um, if you feel that something uh, that we're discussing doesn't solve a problem because some other problem exists, we likely in many cases have that problem solved elsewhere. Um, so what we discussed last week was the separation of money and politics. And so if we knock that out, term limits then becomes um, a worthwhile discussion to see, well, A, have we already knocked it out enough where term limits then aren't as much of something that we should consider? Uh, maybe downsides no longer uh, counter the upsides as much as they did when money was an issue in politics. Um, so it's worth considering um, that that a lot of these, these proposals play together. Um, hopefully that, that helps resolve some of your concern there, Bart. Um, any other questions coming in? I'm just, I haven't given TikTok enough ten attention. Hi folks on TikTok, Charles, thanks so much for coming. Um, maximum F given without term limits we get. Um, I, maximum, I, I appreciate um, your point. Uh, the um, career politicians and the establishment that comes with that is something that we really agree is, is failing us. Um, we, for that reason, are, have a lot of proposals to try to address that. Um, and I think some of them would, would ultimately address this without needing term limits, although we are open to it. Um, getting money out of politics, getting po parties out of politics, things like that could prevent um, politicians who are career politicians from continuing to get reelected time after time. Um, that said, I do want to also just say like it, as part of our, and I don't have it on the screen today, I usually do, but some of the guiding principles for conversations for our constitutional conversations are be curious, be humble, be respectful, be patient, be resilient, and be creative. I do want to just emphasize, be respectful there. Um, I understand your frustration with our career politicians, but, uh, we don't need to do any name calling about any of them, no matter how much we don't like them. Um, so I would just prefer if we can uh, keep our uh, our tone in a very respectful manner and we can talk about these things without relying on those sort of pejoratives. So thank you. But thank you for the question. And I'm open to uh, any follow up questions you have, Maximum. So thanks so much. Hello, Andrew. Um, hello, Eric. Welcome aboard. Um, so just for folks who are joining now, I'm just going to repeat myself a little bit. I apologize to the folks who have been here, but we're talking about a seat at the table and what that means to go beyond simply voting and giving people more of a voice in their government. 
Um, in many cases, we do have um, an avenue called initiatives and referendums at the state level where uh, the people can petition to have specific uh, legislation on the ballot for people to vote on directly. Um, this sort of puts this more in the people's hands by taking it out of the hands of very often um, lobbyists who craft that legislation that ultimately gets voted on by the people and can sometimes be rather manipulative in its language um, to get its bidding done. So in our proposal, a seat at the table where we discuss deliberative democracy and citizen conventions, we ultimately form what we call um, citizen conventions, which are essentially legislative juries, 12 to 24 people picked at random from the jurisdiction um, with some controls for demographic proportionality um, to discuss the issue that, that has been petitioned, that, that has um, spurred the calling of that, con uh, of that citizens convention. And the people come together, those 12 to 24 people from various places um, across the aisle and the ideological spectrum and backgrounds and contexts to learn from each other about the, the concerns they have, to learn from experts that they call independently, um, to, um, to craft legislation and, and solution together. Um, they elect themselves a leader by ranked choice voting, who then takes that legislation to the legislature to be considered independently of all other legislation by the legislature. Um, and they can also put it back to the people on a ballot if that is uh, the avenue that they prefer. So. Um, let's see here. Uh, Leonard says, is the person of good character clause for electing a speaker for a citizen convention realistic? Would it be enforceable in some way? What is the purpose of including it? Great question. Um, so this is one of those things where we are creating a legal construct, a social construct, essentially, that it does not have the same level of enforceability as a lot of things, but enforceability we see as a spectrum, um, one could imagine, um, so firstly, it's a guiding principle for the convention and would inform probably a lot of the education process, the orientation process to, um, to the convention. So when the citizens convene and there is some facilitator from the executive branch or whoever is facilitating um, or at least kicking it off would uh, provide in the materials that this is a criteria for um, for electing a leader of the citizen convention, whether folks know what that means or have the same notion of what that means is up for debate and probably won't always be the case, unfortunately. Um, enforceability, I don't see it as enforceable in any way other than, and this is the purpose of including it, if someone feels that the citizen convention essentially went off the rails and didn't do what it was supposed to do, um, one could see that being providing standing to a citizen in that jurisdiction to essentially um, recall, I'm sorry, not recall, but to call again for the citizen convention by per perhaps using the judiciary to determine was that person of good character. There are ways to determine whether someone's of good character. Did they lie during the proceedings? Were they being paid behind the back of the conventions to bring in certain opinions, things of that matter? Um, could disqualify the results of the convention, et cetera. We don't think we need to be that prescriptive in the language of the amendment itself. We think those would be emergent principles that come out um, by virtue of our ju judicial system, by virtue of decisions and you know, our usual um, common law and um, uh, precedent setting within the, within the judiciary. But that's a great question, Leonard, and let me know if that makes sense to you. Um, Let's see. Maximum F given again. Uh, getting money out of politics is unfortunately a naive struggle, but a very moral idea. Um, we've done it before, Maximum. Uh, unfortunately, Citizens United um, overturned that effort. Um, the effort wasn't perfect, but Citizens United made an imperfect solution that much worse. Um, I think we can do better. Um, and it may be, um, I, I don't think it's a naive struggle. I think it's a struggle we have to have. Um, and I think that the proposals we have, which we discussed last week, I'm sorry if you missed that, you can look it up, uh, the, the discussion there um, online, but we do have some really interesting proposals of how to do that. Um, and, and you're right, personal attacks or frustration felt by the victimized masses, 100% agree, and we need to uh, walk the walk if we're going to talk the talk. So that's why we actually take very seriously our principles such as being respectful, because if we want um, that to happen from others, we have to act that way ourselves. Um, 
No problem, Leonard. Um, you can feel free to always message me after the fact if you have follow-up questions uh, and watch the rest of this talk. Um, any other questions coming in? Uh, let's see here. Hello, Tonster. Um, so, um, yeah, so just to, to continue sort of, again, I think we have sort of a churn of people coming in and out. So, again, we're discussing uh, a seat at the table um, and citizen conventions in a form of deliberative democracy. These are all buzzwords you can look up online to get more detail, or you can watch our explainer video that we posted last week on this. It's a really interesting upgrade to democracy, provides the people with a voice in um, brainstorming solutions to issues, brings them together um, by, uh, by petition. So the jurisdiction, uh, folks in the jurisdiction will petition to want to solve a particular issue. And then uh, 12 to 24 people will be picked at random from that jurisdiction to come together, learn about the issue, work together to figure out the best solution to that issue that uh, has some sort of consensus amongst the people there. Um, and then the outcome of that is presented to the legislature as a potential law um, that the legislature then uh, considers independently of all of the other things they're considering. And um, consequently, if they pass it, the people have written a law for themselves. Um, if not, they can also send it to the to the public via ballot for um, for the public to overrule the legislature on that. But uh, we do have these checks and balances so that it's not a total free for all. But this does give the people a voice and a seat at the table in making laws and also in determining what laws um, or what issues we want to tackle first. What are priorities um, rather than getting sort of um, entrenched in wedge issues or culture war points. This allows the people to pers uh, personally prioritize things that are important to them. Um, whereas as we see right now in our legislature, whether it's in the state level or the local level or the national level, um, the halls of our legislature tend to not be very responsive to uh, what people actually care about, right? These we have laws that are written and just waiting to be taken up, but for some reason, for political reasons, for all sorts of reasons, um, these these laws are just not picked up and discussed. And so this this allows um, the people to sort of force the conversation and to have the conversation for themselves when the legislature refuses to do so. Um, looks like I have one new message. Um, let's see here. Thanks so much, Maximum. It was good to see you. Um, hi, Kathy. Um, do we have any other questions coming in? You know, and the other thing about this issue, and, um, you know, I know we, we don't have that many people today. I apologize for meeting the, uh, moving our meeting, our usual meeting time. I will try not to do that in the future. But um, from just discussing this outside of the context of these constitutional conversations, this is one of those things a lot of people are really excited about when they hear about it. Um, it is not something brand new to the reconstitution. It is already implemented in places internationally. Um, it is an issue, it is a, a solution or an approach to democracy that has been sort of um, in academia for several decades. Um, so it's not brand new, but most people aren't totally aware of it, but it just makes sense, right? And so usually um, the questions are more logistical, but I've been finding that most people that I speak to don't have many concerns about this. Um, the unintended consequences are pretty low because of the checks and balances of uh, in, in needing to still go through the legislature for, um, you know, for uh, for passage. And um, I think, again, a lot of the the concerns are about, well, how do we actually do this in a fair, in a way that's productive and constructive, given the polar polarization um, in a way that doesn't fall victim to some of the same problems we have in uh, everyday dinner table politics um, so I, I, I'm happy to talk a little bit about that, um, if nobody has any questions at the moment. Um, but we do, um, anticipate that, uh, these, these conventions would be, uh, mediated by a, um, by a nonpartisan, uh, conflict resolution, um, agency or, um, just a, a nonpartisan mediation agency in general. There's all sorts of agencies that specialize in all sorts of things, um, in this way. Um, and they would work with the people. And, and in fact, one of our framers of the reconstitution is a conflict resolution mediator and, um, is familiar with many of these agencies that are really quite effective, um, at what they do. And so they would help, um, sort of not just, uh, facilitate the conversations, but also help facilitate who, what experts come in, uh, working with the people to find experts that they mutually agree 
um, would be beneficial to learn from uh, rather than relying on um, the influence of either special interests or previously conceived, uh, preconceived notions of who experts are in the field. Um, so that's sort of the beauty of having these nonpartisan agencies, independent agencies facilitating these things, because there are a lot of external variables that can come into play, such as uh, the experts that are brought in, um, the way the conversations are conducted, who's allowed to speak when, um, things like that. But those are really the devil of the details. Um, those things, I think, um, can be sort of um, subcontracted out, for lack of a better word, to agencies that are really effective at this and ultimately um, are held accountable to the people because if an agency is not good at what they do, they will pick another agency. So that's um, one of those you know, positives of capitalism is that that competition can actually drive uh, really good results as far as having um, the right mediators in the room and successful mediators um, would be brought back again, right? If you do have um, a really great piece of legislation come out of citizens' conventions um, and um, people are really happy with it, oh my gosh, citizens' conventions are great, we solved this problem. Well, we may look back and say, well, which agency did we use to mediate that specific um, issue to run that specific citizen convention, and they may be preferred in the future because they did such a good job that time. So I think um, getting hung up on some of those devil in the details points um, may not be um, as constructive as, as, uh, as, or as, we don't need to spend as much energy there as we might think. Um, I know we are all uh, skeptics and some of us are cynics at this point, given all of the difficulties we've had over the last however many years. Um, in conducting uh, constructive conversations. But um, I do think that as long as you set the right initial conditions, you set the right processes, you set the right principles, um, the, the right um, outcomes will emerge. So that's sort of, the, and that's a general principle that we sort of operate by with the reconstitution is not trying to be over prescriptive about every nitty gritty detail, but expecting that if we nudge the whole system in the right direction, that the nitty gritty details will work themselves out and we will have um, really constructive emergent um, properties. So um, so that's that's um, about a little bit about the details of the uh, of the amendment and the proposal and the concerns there. Um, it would be very interesting if anyone's interested to look into sort of how deliberative, de deliberative democracy is used elsewhere in the world. Um, there's tons of literature on that or videos on that. Um, I'd be happy to field any questions or if anyone wants to send materials that they stumble upon that's super interesting, happy to take a look. Um, we can always learn from the mistakes of the past. And so maybe there are instances in which it didn't work out so great. And we should look into those and learn about them and find ways to mitigate uh, the concerns there. So, um, so yeah, really happy to listen because I'm just one person, although I have a, a bit of a larger group with me um, collaborating on this. Uh, I want the collaboration of, of millions and tens of millions of people uh, who are uh, participating in the reconstitution conversation um, to likewise uh, dig up new information, new critiques, new ideas um, to share um, and comb through together because these are really important questions and really important um, things to mitigate before we actually commit to them. So um, let's see, anyone else have any questions at the moment? Thanks so much for the likes all, I really appreciate it. Um, again, I apologize for our, uh, our different time today. Um, we usually do Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, but today we are doing Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, just, I guess, a rewind for a second on our um, on our general sort of what we're doing here. Um, the reconstitution is a national conversation. We've drafted 10 proposed constitutional amendments, but by no means as a group, um, there's roughly six of us. Um, do we feel that we represent adequately the American people um, as a whole? So uh, this is our first of multiple series of constitutional conversations where we go through our 22 highlighted proposals within our 10, am 10 amendments, one at a time, week after week, with input from the people, 
um, as we grow our movement, as we grow our followers, et cetera, um, to integrate that feedback into now a second edition that we will eventually put out um, based on all of your feedback. And then we will do the process again. Um, and this is the equivalent of what, um, what was done sort of in the late 1700s as we were passing the original constitution, the Federalist Papers. Uh, were published as a way for the people to get visibility into the Constitution as it was being drafted um, and to get buy-in from the people and give it legitimacy once it was adopted. And so that's what we're trying to do here. So we're doing multiple things simultaneously. Um, and the interesting thing about the 21st century is that we can get feedback from you in the process. And that's sort of the beauty of the reconstitution and how it's different from the original constitution. Um, and again, for those who are less familiar with generally what we're doing, we're not throwing away the original constitution. We are amending it, amending it relatively significantly in comparison to the past. Um, but it is a series of amendments. Um, and so, yes, so we are running these conversations to, uh, get feedback, to get visibility, to, get momentum to get buy-in and to build this movement. Um, and we will co continue to run through these amendments and these proposals one by one. Um, and when we get to the end of them, we'll start over again and do the next edition until we have adequate uh, support and consensus from the people and we all feel comfortable uh, that this is something worth um, pulling the trigger on for a constitutional convention. Because we have gotten that question. There are many groups out there who are interested in calling for a constitutional convention. We don't think that we are ready to call for a constitutional convention until there's enough consensus in the country about what we actually want to do there. Um, if there is division and polarization going into that constitutional convention, we can end up with a disaster. We can end up with um, with extremist um, uh, legislation. Um, we can end up with all sorts of things. And we can also end up with just generally a more polarized conversation coming out of it and a lot of blaming of why it wasn't successful. Um, so... There is um, a lot to do here, um, but again, I think a seat at the table, the nice thing about this proposal in particular, is it acts as sort of a microcosm of the general reconstitution uh, process, which is a constitutional convention. And so these citizen conventions are miniature versions of what we're trying to do on a larger scale um, at a local level, at a state level, at a national level, but on specific issues rather than on the country, on the constitution as a whole. Um, and so I think it's a really interesting one to look at because it does sort of set the stage for how we might do this on a grander scale. Um, and we are working with some other organizations to define um, how that process of calling an, a constitutional convention would work, who would attend it, who, how it would, uh, the processes and the procedures by which it would be conducted, um, and more on that to come um, in the coming months. We're still working on that, but we'll, we will have a separate session on that uh, specifically with the human rights effort. Um, any other questions? I've been talking a lot. Um, if not, we might end a little bit early today. Um, I think this is, again, a relatively straightforward uh, concept. Legislative juries, citizen conventions, initiatives are people are things people are familiar with. So maybe we don't need to spend as much time today. I know also I apologize again for moving the time. I think that led to a little bit lower attendance than usual. So maybe some less questions than our, than our usual constitutional conversation. But again, we will be circling back to this subject again um, in months from now when we, when we circle back for our second sweep of all of our proposals. We're always exp um, accepting feedback via social media, via our stub stack, um, et cetera. Uh, feel free to comment, send questions, send feedback. We are That is part of what we are doing here with these constitutional conversations with this whole movement is trying to hear the voices of the people, make sure it's heard, make sure it's seen, make sure it's integrated uh, properly into the document so that as we continue to uh, move through this process, um, we gain credibility, we gain the um, the effectiveness of the document we're creating becomes better and better um, and the movement becomes stronger and stronger. So if there are no further questions, I'm going to end a bit early today. Um, I'll hold for one more mo moment because I saw some folks join. Hello, Chad. Um, anyone on the Instagram or Facebook or YouTube channel have any specific questions or Twitter? Um, if not, we will break. Um, I think there's someone in here. Okay. Um, all right. Well, then on that note, we'll break for today. I appreciate everyone's time, um, everyone's um, engagement here, uh, some really great questions coming through. Um, and again, we're here uh, to answer questions asynchronously as well outside of these conversations. Um, and we will be back next week for a really interesting discussion. Please look out for our video coming on Monday 
on the assembly of shared interests and a third chamber of Congress. That is totally innovative and new. Um, we look forward to seeing you there. Thanks so much and have a great night.